Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Foltz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana. She's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Located about two miles north of Ponchatoula, Louisiana, the antique capital of the world, and about an hour from the New Orleans French Quarter is a country-style manor house. Constructed prior to the Civil War, many notables have either visited or lived in this home for the last 135 years. In fact, to pay homage to the previous dwellers, an interesting ceiling border, hand-painted displaying their family names, can be found around the den. With its hard pine floors, eight fireplaces, and 12-foot ceilings, the home is a rare find nestled in these hundred-year-old oaks that line the property. When Garnet and Kathy Biedenbaugh restored the home in its beautiful 10 acres, they didn't stop with the house gardens and outbuildings. They even rejuvenated the beautiful acre leg that adds the perfect finishing touch to this tranquil setting. I'm Chef John Foles. Welcome to a paradise of azaleas, camellias, and dogwoods. Welcome to Butoff Manor. This country estate was home away from home for the present owner because she visited her cousin Hattie Butoff here every summer when she was a young girl growing up in the city. Kathy's interior design career gave her an edge when she spotted this gorgeous piece. Y'all, it's said to have been owned by Al Capone himself. The 135-year-old home was the site of a huge Civil War encampment and, as you can see, was built of old Louisiana cypress. The fireplaces in the home are a beautiful backdrop for this magnificent dining room, where Kathy serves up her pancake en surprise to early morning diners. But Off Manor offers three overnight accommodations, including this East Lake bedroom suite, further enhanced by Victorian linens. Y'all, wait till I introduce you to Anita Walker, whose linens are displayed throughout the house. This interesting bedroom displays a brass queen-size bed with elegant appointments, creating the perfect romantic getaway. Cheers, y'all. And take a look at this 1890s clawfoot bathtub. Kathy and Garnet felt the B&B needed a spacious bath in our Greek. Hundred-year-old live oaks, a one-acre pond, and a secluded pier way in the back completes this charming setting. What a place to share a moonlight stroll. It's absolutely gorgeous. Garnet and Kathy have renovated this Greek revival home to the splendor of long ago summer days when Kathy's best memories were made here. But off manner, true country life close enough to the city guaranteeing the best of both worlds. And yes, y'all, where new memories are made each and every day. Y'all, when I think of a B and B or even a country inn, I think of a a, a secluded residence out in the, the rural areas. And a hotel, well, Main Street, center of town. Pull up to the front door, and Valley brings your luggage inside. But you know what makes a B and B really special is when it's close enough to a city to enjoy the best of both worlds. And that's exactly what sets, in my opinion, Butoff Manor apart because it's only about 10 or 15 minutes from Ponchatoula, Louisiana, the antique capital of the world. Did you hear me? 
antique capital of the world. And right down the road, I would say about a stone's throw, 30 minutes or so if you drive the way I do, New Orleans, Louisiana. So you do have the best of both worlds, and that's what I love about a B and b is that you're able to get away from it all, but hey, just grab it right there. All of it is just a hand's reach away. So y'all, a couple of great dishes that we discovered right outside of Ponchatoula, Louisiana, in a kitchen that was designed by Kathy herself because uh, she was really great. She knew what she wanted to do when she built her kitchen, so uh, these dishes came right out of that magnificent space that she created there. The first is a pancake dish, a breakfast dish, but a pancake dish with a twist. So I want you to look into my bowl here. I want to make the batter for that pancake first. This is pan strawberry pancake en surprise, as I say in French. It's a surprise uh, for your guests. So I have two uh, eggs down in here, and I'm going to put in about three-fourths of a cup of flour, and I'm going to mix that up just kind of to, to blend the eggs and the flour as best I can. Then I'm going to slowly uh, dust in, or I should say pour in, uh, the milk, because you want to break this up about three-fourths of a cup. And you know the good thing about this uh, pancake? You can actually leave it, y'all, just a little bit lumpy. Uh, not, not often can you say that about a pancake or a waffle batter, but in this particular case, there's nothing wrong with making it just a little bit lumpy. Now I'm going to put into it a little touch of cinnamon, a little touch of nutmeg, and kind of put your own uh, flavors in here, a little touch of lemon juice is really nice, and rum. Hey, you better believe it. You want to wake them up in the morning, y'all. Put a little rum in here. A New Orleans style, Panchatula style. Just kind of whisk that around. Now I have my, uh, my batter for my beautiful little uh, pancake en surprise ready to go. Now for the surprise, y'all. Take a look at this. In my little skillet, I'm going to put a touch of a butter, just a little bit, because I'm going to saute some strawberries. That's right, saute strawberries. You wouldn't think of uh, sauteing uh, fraise de bois, as we call it, the berries of the woods, or those really nice sweet strawberries. But right outside of uh, <coughs> New Orleans in the town of Ponchatoula is the strawberry capital of the world, y'all. So there's a lot of dishes created with strawberries, and this is one of those dishes. Really, really nice little berries. And I just love the wild strawberries as well. Those little alpine berries, you can find them growing in pastures, or especially in rural areas. You find those, they're smaller than regular strawberries, but beautiful for this dish. Now, when I say surprise, it's gonna be a surprise, y'all, because the berries are at the bottom of this uh, saute pan with the butter, cooking real nicely. You want to wilt those berries, pull the sugar out. I could even put a touch of cinnamon and nutmeg right on top of uh, the berries. I could flame them in a little rum, but remember, I have the batter already in, uh, in my uh, little bowl here, so now I'm going to pour the batter right on top. That's right, right on top of these berries. Now take a look at that. And you're going to have to smooth the batter around, just kind of smooth it around to cover the berries because this is going to just kind of move that around like this. And you can imagine the flavor there, right, y'all? You can just see it popping out of that skillet. Now, you notice that it's sauteing here, and uh, the, the pancake is starting to crisp up on the bottom. I'm going to take it now and put it into a 400-degree oven, and I would bake it for about 15 to 18 minutes. It's going to souffle up right out of the skillet, and it's going to be almost... Uh, uh, it's going to be almost so airy and light, it's fantastic. And let me show you the way you serve it. You just turn it out of the skillet right onto a really nice decorative platter. And of course, the strawberries are going to show up. And then you just do this, dust it with gorgeous powdered sugar. And when you put it on the platter, put it on a platter that also has powdered sugar dusted all around the bottom of it because the uh, pancake will then be able to pick up the sugar from the, uh, uh, from the bottom and just cut it almost like a pizza. Uh, you can even make it in a much larger skillet, of course, and, uh, uh, and, and serve a couple people out of it. This is one portion, needless to say, one portion. Okay, y'all, the next dish. The next dish that I found at Botoff Manor, one of the really, really nice dishes that you would find in a country home, 
quail, y'all. Quail, a stuffed quail butoff. And I want you to take a look at this platter because it has all of the ingredients, not only the uh, Bob White or Pharaoh quail. This, the, the quail here has been, uh, been deboned and um, and uh, uh, I like deboned quail because the breast meat, can, you can cut right through the breast meat. There's a little bone in the legs and the wings, so it presents really, uh, really well. And then, of course, you're going to make a stuffing to put inside of that bird. And I have the uh, stuffing already gone in my skillet, and I'm st I've started off with Italian sausage. But hey, kind of make your own if you want to. Just kind of put some ground meat or seafood. You don't have to use meat. Seafood is a great stuffing for quail uh, in Louisiana as well. So let's take a look at my uh, sauteing sausage here. Italian sausage gives uh, a really nice uh, base to any type of stuffing. And you can pour some of the fat off of it. But remember, y'all, fat is good in stuffing. So don't start pouring it all out of there. I'm going to go ahead now and put into this some onion, celery, bell pepper, because this is going to be the main stuffing for that bird. Of course, it's also a great dressing for a turkey on the side table for Thanksgiving or holidays. This is also a great dressing, as we would call it. The only difference between a stuffing and a dressing, one goes in the bird, one goes in the bowl. That's the only difference I've found. Garlic now, and remember, this is Italian sausage, so it's already has, it already has great spice in it. And uh, I'm going to stir that around. It has a little anise flavor, too, y'all, which I love a lot in Italian sausage. And uh, quail, y'all, is one of those birds that's truly American. When the colonists arrived here, they didn't even know what to call it, so they named it after one of their European birds, partridge. Partridge in a, what, a pear tree? Or, but <laughs> partridge in a... In a a, a, a French bird, a, a, a European bird, but then of course they realized it wasn't in the same family and today quail is quail and partridge is partridge. So we have all of this sauteing. Now I'm going to put a little sage into it. Just a little touch of sage, y'all, because nothing makes stuffings better than sage. So I'll tell you that around. Now for the breadcrumbs. All of this is in here. I, gotta, I wanna throw a little wine in here first. So you can deglaze this with any of your favorite wines. I'm gonna put a little red wine into it. It's gonna really pick up the quality of this stuffing. And I also wanna throw in just a little bit of my favorite Creole seasoning down in here and a little bit extra spice, y'all. A little bit extra pepper. So I'll put that in. And then of course, breadcrumbs. You can put breadcrumbs out of the can. You can make your own breadcrumbs. These are just dried cubed pieces of bread. And then about a cup and a half of good chicken stock to blend all of this stuffing together. And remember, if it gets a little bit too watery, add more breadcrumbs. If it's too dry, just go ahead and add more of the uh, stock. And of course, y'all taste this stuff. Put it in your mouth. Get some flavors going here. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have a bland stuffing. Now, once this is done, you want to let it cool because you never want to stuff a bird with hot stuffing. But let's go ahead and take the quail. And I want to go ahead and stuff the uh, inside with some of this nice cooled uh, stuffing I have here. And you know, it, it's one of these things that you have to kind of get your hands in. There's no way you're going to keep from getting messy when you do this. And I have a couple of them already done. And I want you to take a look in my little skillet over here rather than fight these for you. I know, I know you know how to do that. Just take a look at the birds that I already have here. I want to come right on the top of them with a little sage, a little thyme, a little basil. Put some of that great Creole seasoning on top of it like this, y'all. And you can put just a touch more of butter on top of them. And then they're going to go into a 400 degree oven for just about 20 minutes until they get nice and golden brown. And take a look at these over here. They're absolutely fantastic. And while you're looking at this, y'all, I want you to know that when I was over at Butoff Manor, Kathy was good enough to take me into the kitchen and give me her favorite recipe for barbecued shrimp tangibahoa. It was a typical barbecued uh, uh, shrimp dish of Louisiana because all restaurants do it. But boy, did she have an interesting little twist uh, uh, with it, and we use those gorgeous Gulf shrimp. Wait till you see this dish. Ah, it smells great. Uh, Kathy, last time I was here, you shared with me a great barbecued shrimp recipe. In fact, you said it was even named after the pirates. Right. Barbecued shrimp tangibahoa. And I'm starting here, just as you said, with a quarter pound of butter, 
and a quarter cup of really good extra virgin olive oil, and that's the key, right? It sure is. Oh, it sure good, is. Good olive oil. So what else goes in here? Well, we want to add about a quarter of a cup of all these goodies. We have some red onions. Go ahead and throw them in there. There oh, you go. Yeah. Look at that good sizzle, okay? And then the best thing of all we've got here is this great garlic. All right. Boy, I love garlic. Oh. The more the merrier. Yeah, never too much garlic. Whew. Then we have a little bit of rosemary. Okay. And some basil. It really smells good. Boy, all of these herbs smell great. Some oregano. Okay. And some thyme. All right, now I guess you could substitute just about any herb. Too. Oh, yeah, but other people have different tastes they like, so they could do that. And then the best thing we want to top it off with is some great green onions. All right, boy, I tell you, the smell, the aroma is incredible. Why don't you start that, and I'll go ahead and add the rest of the ingredients. Okay. Some good Worcestershire sauce, about, oh, I'd say oh. about another quarter cup. You always want to have that in barbecued shrimp. And we'll spice it up with a couple of drops of hot sauce. A couple of nice hot sauce drops in there. And then the final ingredient. Too bad our <laughs> listeners can't smell this. Ooh, beer, beer, y'all. Just a little bit, though, huh? Not too much. All right. Okay, now the sauce is done. Why, why are we uh, cooking it? Why couldn't we just put everything raw right on top of the shrimp? Because we want to let the flavor simmer a little bit because if you put it in the oven with the shrimp right away, you're going to overcook your shrimp. Yeah, that's a good point because you only want to cook the shrimp just a couple of minutes. Well, good. The sauce is done. So let's go ahead and pour them right over the shrimp. Mm, boy, this smell is just incredible. And y'all take a look at the shrimp. 1620 white shrimp. These were swimming in the Gulf of Mexico this morning, huh? Oh, look nice at and fresh. Nice and fresh. Y'all put this right on top. This aroma is incredible. You go ahead and season them. No. Okay, just a little bit of salt and okay. some wonderful Creole seasoning. All right. And then we want to take and top it off for some color. We want to put some red and some yellow there peppers. Go, throw it in there. And I'm going to put a little bit more spice, some fresh cracked pepper right in there. Now, of course, I would bake this at 350 degrees for 15 minutes, and that's basically all to it. Okay. Sounds pretty good, Here's doesn't it? oven later. Okay, and you have some already done there, I huh? did. I got them all ready for you, John. Oh, look how great these are. Now, you know the only thing we need? We need some hot, crusty French bread. Absolutely. That's it. Hot, crusty French bread. <laughs> Kathy, the aroma of these shrimp are incredible, huh? It sure is. You can really see and smell all those herbs. <laughs> and garlic, the garlic flavor. I wish everybody could smell this. You know, we were talking, that the, the home has been in your family for the past 50 years or so. Tell us a little bit about the house. Right, a relative of mine owned it, and she had it for 50 years. And I had been coming up here since the 50s, and she knew how much I loved it. And in her will, she left my husband and I the option to purchase it from the estate. So we were thrilled. So you've had many, many great experiences here growing up. Absolutely. And all my children grew up fishing in the pond. So, you, you know, one of the things that's so evident as you drive into the property is the beautiful gardens, the magnificent oak trees, all the natural landscaping. How many acres do you have? And, and even more importantly, who takes care of all of this? We have ten and a half acres, and Garnet and I do all the work ourselves. Um, we kind of follow in Hattie and Carl's footsteps because they did it. They planted all the azaleas and the dogwood themselves, and it was really a, a labor of love, and we're kind of trying to keep up that tradition. When did y'all decide, though, after you, you had the house, obviously, you, you, at some point you made the decision to open a B&B. &B. Uh, when was that? Well, I think uh, we've been thinking about it for a long time. Garnet and I, when we would travel, we would stay in B&Bs. And at one point, we looked into a home in New Orleans that we were going to do. So we, we've known we would like to do it, but we just felt like we had to get to a certain point where we could open it here. Well, what are some of the memories that you can recall about special guests or just as an innkeeper? It's the people. I mean, you find so many interesting people, and from all walks of life, and we sit sometimes in the evening with them and have sherry or go out on the deck. And um, it's just really nice to find people from all over the states. We haven't had anybody from Europe yet, but hopefully. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the most memorable couples was one from California. And she was a graphic designer who did work for major companies putting together brochures. And he was the head of virtual reality here mm -hmm. in the United States. He presented uh, to the FBI and the CIA the Oklahoma bombing, so it, it was really interesting. Gee, I get it. And y'all just sat around talking about we those did. experiences. Now, I know that uh, uh, you probably put on some pretty big family dinners here because y'all have a real big family. And I know you've uh, told me the story about having 50, 60 people around this kitchen in the yards. 
if you ever need uh, the, the hands of a chef to come and give, uh, give a little help on one of those holidays, I might, you know, want to tray it out a night in the house or something. Sounds good to me. <laughs> I know where to get you. I've got your number. <laughs> Just give me a call. I'll be happy to come. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hey, what can I say? I'm sorry you are there to dip French bread with us into that sauce. Oh, I tell you, it was, uh, it was like a miracle happening, y'all. But take a look at a couple of other great dishes we picked up at Buttoff Manor. First of all, my garlic studded pork tenderloin. And this is roasted, y'all, after it's been seasoned with basil, thyme, tarragon, garlic, a little cane syrup on top, baked 400 degrees for 20 minutes. And then right next to it, the best doggone pecan pie you'll ever put in your mouth. And it's also baked at about, oh, I guess somewhere 425 for 10 minutes and then drop it to 375 for 35 minutes. Brown sugar, pecans. You see how nice and light it is? That's the orange juice that I put in it, y'all. Now, when I think of lemons, I think of, uh, you know, something for a tabletop. But at Buttoff Manor, I saw so many great lemons. I was lucky enough to find a shop right there in Ponchatoula, Anita Walker's Larison Walker Antiques, who gave me a lesson in what lemons are really all about. Hey, y'all come on in. Anita, I was walking by this beautiful uh, big glass window here, and I, I noticed that you're obviously an antique store. There's a lot of great art here. Uh, but you're a source of really great lemons. Is this all antique or some new? These are all old, John. We have, um, we have a wide range of old from the early 1800s all up, up into the 1950s, but they are all old. In this uh, uh, seemingly casual world we live in, you know, I think of going out on the patio and throwing a, a tablecloth down and maybe even using some plastic or styrofoam glasses. <laughs> is, is there a resurgence, a new interest in, uh, in linen? Um, I think there's a new interest in, in the casual approach to linen. It's not just linen, using linens doesn't mean that you just bring out your grandmother's tablecloth mm. at Christmas. It's a, it, you can use them very casually. We all live casually today, and it's important to just, you know, not worry about the wrinkles and just use them. Uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't care if a little uh, uh, glass of wine spills over or, or even if uh, Uncle Fred drops a cigarette <laughs> ash on it. <laughs> you know, all the old things are going to have some imperfections. That's, that's, that's part of the patina of, of old things, and linens are just the same. You know, they might have a few little tads, a few little stains, but it's, it adds character. Why, why should anybody take the time to, first of all, learn about it, and second of all, to use linen? Well, I, th I think linen, linens are just a work of art. I mean, the, the, the handwork and the, the, the quality is just something that is, is just a dying art today, and it's a touchy-feely kind of thing, and you, it's like having a little work of art in your home that you can touch and feel. Uh, how, how difficult, though, is it to care for this? When I look at this real fine lace and this beautiful embroidery, uh, does this take a, a, a lot of work, a lot of care? The important thing to remember, John, is not to use bleach. Bleach destroys the natural fibers. Always use a non-chlorine product when you're washing linens. If you have a more delicate uh, piece, you might want to soak it in your uh, sink or your bathtub or uh, if you have a more durable piece of linen, then you can just throw it in the machine, throw it in the dryer, and it's made to last, and it has lasted over the, over the years. Now, can, can you actually find this? I mean, this looks like some really nice work. Can you still find a lot of this today, or do you have to go back 100 years to get a piece like this? You can find this today. There are some, some linen um, houses in Europe and, and, um, that, and I guess some in, the, in America, too, that make this. But if you're comparing this quality to, to a new quality of the same value, then you're going to pay probably three or four times as much. Well, well now that's a big question to me. There's a lot of retail stores out there, big giant retailers that seem to have tremendous sections on linen. Uh, uh, as compared to this, what's the big difference, uh, not, not only in price but quality? Well, they're, they're like anything else. There's, there's lots of levels of quality, so you have to be sure that you're comparing apples with apples. Um, you can buy some good, in, you know, nice inexpensive linens today for, for more casual parties on the patio or whatever, but you're not, you're not finding, you're not going to have this quality, which is okay. You can have, you know, it doesn't always have to be perfect 
wonderful quality all the time. You know, when I think of uh, Lennon as a chef, obviously, I think of setting this grand table and putting a, a, a nice cloth on it, but, uh, but, but how, how should I approach Lennon's as a, a, when I'm setting up mm -hmm. a table? Well, John, in Louisiana, as you well know, eating a good meal and preparing a good meal is such an important part of our culture and our tradition. And linens just are just a perfect complement to that. I mean, it's not something we, we're going to set a table every day. We're all too busy for that. But every once in a while, it's a wonderful way to have a dining experience. Well, great. And there's a lot of fantastic resource material. I see a lot of books here in the store. So I'm going to definitely pick, me, <laughs> pick up one of those books to take home and read up a little bit about the use of linen. So thanks so much for having us here today. Thank you. Good, and thanks to all of you for stopping by as we continue to visit the bed and breakfasts of the Bayou State and cook up more great taste of Louisiana. Take a look at this linen book here. Look how beautiful the pictures are in here and all the great table settings, too. Mm -hmm. so look, look at, at this. that. To learn more about A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Folson Company, visit PBS online at the internet address on your screen. Hot beignets and warm boudoirs by Chef John Foltz is available for $29.95. This companion book to the series features over 150 recipes. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen. Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Foltz and Company is made possible in part by Zataran's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zataran's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana. She's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.